Acts chapter 13, verses 4 through 12. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a false prophet, excuse me, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, or so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You, who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. When he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, we ask that you would give us clarity, that you would give us wisdom, give us understanding to know what your word says and discernment as we seek to understand it, not only in our cultural context, but give us wisdom as we seek to live it out. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I'm gonna ask us uh, to consider how we think about Jesus. Uh, who is the Jesus that we worship? Uh, who is the Jesus that is proclaimed in scripture. Before we get into the details of the sermon, I, I want us to consider for a moment that there is a dynamic whenever the word of God is heard by me, by you, by those who profess faith in Christ and by those who don't. There will always be an overlap between the word of God and whatever culture we are in when we hear it. In other words, there will always be things that we can look at in God's revelation and say, I understand that, I agree with it because it's like my culture. Whether we're in uh, North America, we're in Europe, whether we are in Africa or Asia, wherever the gospel is preached to any tribe, tongue or nation, there will always be an area of overlap. That overlap theologians call common or general revelation and or common grace. Those two concepts are not the same, but they're close, if theologically speaking. That is, it is God's preserving grace as he has uh, uh, in his providence ordered a culture and that culture will have certain values that are shared by scripture. And often those who are missionaries, church planters, will use that area of overlap to communicate the gospel. And they'll begin with that. They'll begin with areas where that culture, that subgroup, that particular demographic understands and shares values with God's revelation. But there's another side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that in the same way, there will always be values, perspectives, beliefs, ideas, and desires that cultures do not share with scripture. Not only those in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, 
and in the Middle East, right, Indonesia, but also here in the good old USA, there will always be values, beliefs, and ideas that are contrary to scripture. So while scripture communicates with culture in certain areas, and those areas differ from one culture to the next, but there will, while there will always be areas in which scripture reinforces and communicates with, speaks to cultures in agreement, there will always be areas where scripture speaks to any culture that it, in a way that corrects it. And I submit to you that this morning, we are in a culture in the United States that like every other culture has certain ideas and beliefs that are in accord with scripture and others that are in contradiction to scripture. And I would like for us to think about that as we look at our text this morning, because it may seem to you that this is an innocuous, if not somewhat interesting, uh, account of a, a Sunday school story, right? It's a little adventure. Paul and Barnabas are on their little adventure, and they're, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, Bilbo Baggins in The Lord of the Rings, he, or in The Hobbit, you know, off he goes, and this is just his first adventure, and oh, isn't this interesting? We have this fellow who claims to be a magician, and that's kind of an interesting story. Now, can I color my Sunday school sheet and go play in the playground, right? But when we look under the surface, as I hope to show you, there, there is a reality underneath this that we do well to pay attention to. And the reality is that there is a, an area where the gospel makes sense with Sergius Paulus. And there is also side by side, there is a confrontation between the gospel and the powers of darkness. Now this morning, uh, I'm going to make uh, references to two other passages in scripture. And uh, you're welcome to turn there with me if you wish, but you don't have to, all right? But I am going to stick my thumb in my Bible. I'm gonna be flipping back and forth. And I hope that that will not be distracting to you, okay? But I want you to get the idea that there, this passage does not stand alone. This passage has parallels in a number of places in scripture where we see these ideas. And if you are like me, and I suspect that in many ways you are because we come from the same culture, there is a part of this sermon that gives us great comfort. But if you're like me, there is a part of this sermon that makes me feel uncomfortable and it probably will make you feel uncomfortable as well. But I want to start by saying we're under obligation to embrace the Christ of Scripture and not the Christ of my preferences or yours. Now, I want us to see here that the big idea, okay, the big idea here is that side by side, we have a gospel that is proclaimed about a Christ who is mighty, but his might is not only demonstrated in saving his people, his might is also demonstrated in judging those who oppose the word of God. Now, immediately, most people in our culture, and perhaps you and I as well, have something in us that just went up. It's a defense mechanism. And we say, that's something I don't like, right? And I can tell by some of, some, some of you as you're sitting there, your, your body language is telling me you don't like it, <laughs> okay? And my, my job here is to proclaim to you not only what I like and what you like, but what I don't like. And all of us, to one degree or another, should have a reaction of fear when we see Christ's power exerted against those who oppose the gospel. Because some part of our conscience tells us 
that if we're not there now, we used to be, right? That's what uh, some, I think it was John Calvin who said, there is still a splinter. There's enough of a splinter in the covenant of works, right? But from Adam, from the fall, that all of us know that outside of Christ, we're under condemnation. Our, that's the reason we have consciences, right? I want us to look at the parallels between this passage and others in the Bible, not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament. I want us to see that this is not a new concept and it's all through scripture. Now you don't have to turn there, but just think with me for a moment about Genesis chapter three. That's the first place we see the gospel, right? Theologians call it the proto-evangel, the early or primitive, the first expression of the gospel. Genesis 3, verse 15, God has seen Adam and Eve sin, right? And his, his first response is not to speak to them, which is interesting, is to speak to the serpent, right? And he tells the serpent that the seed of the woman is going to crush his head, right? Right there at the first proclamation of the gospel, God tells the serpent, you're in for it. And I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, all right? So in the first proclamation of the gospel, where he says that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, which is ultimately fulfilled in Christ, this idea of conflict, this idea of God's might overcoming opposition is right there in seed form. As we skip down a little farther uh, into Exodus, we see that on a uh, larger scale, we have a parallel here between this passage in Acts and the, the, the series of conflicts that Moses has in Egypt. And just like Sergius Paulus had a false prophet, a diviner, if you will, we see that, Mo uh, you remember Pharaoh had magicians, right? And the magician's job was to help the Pharaoh make decisions by forecasting the future, right? And as, the, as God unleashes these 10 plagues, which are all designed to mock the specific, specific gods in Egypt, right? The magicians at some point are able, they initially can produce, reproduce the results, but eventually they say, this is God, we can't do this. Remember that? And so Moses, by the word of God, proclaims deliverance through Yahweh, a specific God, right? And he does, it, it's not just a, hey, you know, that's a great idea. Uh, let me send you guys out into the wilderness and do whatever you want, because I certainly want to worship your God too, right? It's a, over my dead body, you're leaving, and there's absolutely no way, and I don't even know what God you're talking about, and you're not doing this. And so right, right there during loggerheads, right? And as the gospel is proclaimed, the message of the announcement of God's deliverance of his people is proclaimed, there is conflict with not only the, the, the Pharaoh, but all the gods that he professes to worship. So right there, conflict is part and parcel of the gospel. I want us to look more specifically at a passage that Paul alludes to here. And you'll recognize it immediately. You, you, you see there where Paul says, will you not cease to make crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And you know, of course, that is a, an allusion to Isaiah chapter 40, right? Isaiah chapter 40. Now I'm going to read uh, excerpts. I'm going to walk us through that text. And I want us to see that there are parallels. And then we're going to think about how it applies in our Christian life. In Isaiah chapter 40, comfort, oh, comfort my people. Right? How, do we, how does God comfort us? He comforts us by delivering us from everything that oppresses us, beginning with our sin. Right? Comfort my people. That's the gospel. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare is ended. And ultimately, her, her warfare is not just with her enemies, but her warfare is with God, right? Our warfare has ended. That's what Paul says in Romans 5, that we have peace with God. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Her iniquity has been removed, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. We're not only brought back to uh, the place where Adam was in the garden with, with his innocence, but now we've received a double, so to speak, because we've been imputed with the righteousness of Christ. Right? A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain and rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, what is the word of God? We're about to find out. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. And that Hebrew phrase there, that term good news in the Septuagint, the Greek translation is translated as euangelion, gospel. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him. And we love that. We love that, right? His reward is with him. We're going to get the good stuff when Christ returns, right? We're going to get the crowns that we cast at his feet. We're going to have, uh, be transformed, Paul says, if we're alive while Christ returns from uh, mortal to immortal. Or if we've gone before and we're with Christ, then we'll return with him. And at the resurrection, we will get our new bodies. That sounds great. But of course, the text continues and his recompense before him. Uh-oh, what is that? His recompense. That's another, that's a synonym for the J word, right? The J word that we don't like to hear, right? Then he says, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. So there's the gospel, right? We, his people in Christ are brought in like lambs and we're held there. The, the picture of perfect serenity, perfect safety. So he goes on and he describes the nations, right? The nations are, are small. The nations are inconsequential, right? But here in Isaiah 40, we have these two ideas side by side. We have uh, the gospel, which is the, uh, the gathering of us, his people, into his arm. He carries us in his bosom. But with that, we have God's recompense. We have the expression of his wrath against the nations. If you skip down uh, to verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. That term storm is prominent in Job, right? When God appears in the storm, he not only speaks to Job at the end of the book, but the storm is what takes away all of Job's crops. The storm is what kills his children. Lift up your eyes on high. He says, he blows on them and they wither. To whom would you liken me? He says, lift up your eyes on high. So uh, at the same time that God encourages his people, he says that the, the enemies of his people, those who oppose his redemptive work in his people are judged. 
Now, this idea, this passage is quoted in another place in the New Testament. You may remember it is in uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. So since we've been reading Luke's account in Acts, I encourage you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Because this is the passage that uh, Luke speaks of when he addresses, when he describes the ministry of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> we have some historical setting in verse 1 and 2. It says, the word of God came to John. This is Luke chapter 3, verse 2. The word of God, that's a term there, word of God, remember from Isaiah 40, came to John, the son of Zacharias, and lowered us. It's been interesting, he was in the wilderness, right? Then he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough places smooth, all the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now, we won't get into the details here, but instead of glory of God, uh, Luke renders that term as salvation of God. But for what it's worth, in Isaiah particularly, God's glory is often associated with his salvation of his people. He reveals his glory by saving his people. Okay. Now, we're going to skip over the ethical instructions that John has for the people who come to him. But for our purposes, I just want you to see that uh, he skips down and he, he gives ethical instructions. And then he begins to speak about uh, someone greater than himself. Verse 15, while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, as for me, I baptize you in water. But one is coming, the Lord is coming, Isaiah 40, who is mightier than I. There's the idea of God's might. I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. Now, that sounds like the judgment motif, but it's not. It's actually the provision motif. It's analogous to Isaiah saying that uh, God will gather us into his bosom. Why? Because when God gives us his spirit, he's giving us himself. When he baptizes us in his spirit, this was fulfilled at Pentecost, he is providing us with himself. This is a gospel uh, motif here, the idea of uh, God's providing for us. And he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand. What does it mean to winnow? It means to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? There has to be a separation. He will thoroughly, with it, clear his threshing floor. And to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up with chaff, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Fire is always a picture of judgment in Scripture. It's a metaphor of God's judgment. So John is saying, I'm not the Christ. Someone is coming after me who's mighty. And he's so mighty that he's going to provide for his people, not just food and water, like the imagery of the, the lambs in Isaiah 40 and Psalm 23, but he's going to provide something even more abundant for his people, which is himself, his spirit. And as he does that, at the very same time, this process will result in a separation of wheat from chaff. And that's the part that you and I don't like. We like Sergius Paulus in Acts 13 believing in Christ. We like that. We like the fact that on Paul's first missionary journey, the gospel is proclaimed, and a man who is described as being intelligent, who is a governing official, in the, he's totally pagan, by the way, Sergius Paulus is the first completely pagan uh, unbeliever to come to Christ with no association with the synagogue. And we like the fact that this man who is of intelligence and power is coming to Christ and embracing the gospel. And it's easy for us to say, well, I guess that magician, that magician deserved it, right? Because he's trying to, he's the bad guy in the story. But it's not just about bad guys in stories. It's about the fact that we don't get the gospel without the conflict 
We don't get the gospel without the opposition. We don't get the gospel without those who are actively working, not on behalf of the seed of the woman, but on behalf of the seed of the servant. They always go together. Always. And so we like the idea that Christ, if we're, we may be a little bit nervous about it, but we like the idea that Christ baptizes us with his spirit and with fire. The fire is going to purify the dross, right? One expression of the fire is the opposition that the gospel encounters from the world and the flesh and the devil. And we absolutely, as a culture, hate the idea that Christ is clearing a threshing floor. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me that that idea is re universally rejected in our culture, even in many evangelical churches, I, I, my first uh, question would be to ask, did you sense your defense mechanisms going on? When I said that, did you, did you sense your defensive mechanisms going up when I, when I start talking about gospel and then I start talking about judgment? Because the reason we like Psalm 23, uh, but we don't like other Psalms that are in the category we call imprecatory. We don't know what to do with those, right? It's the reason that we like God's yes, but we don't like his no. And brothers and sisters, we don't get God's yes without also getting his name. It doesn't work that way. And so Christ is clearing his threshing floor. He is using a winnowing fork to clear the space so that in that forum, in that arena, where the word of God is preached, the wheat will be separated from the chaff. He has to clear the floor so that they get the big basket out, right? And they throw it up and the, and the heavy seed remains and the chaff is blown away. Psalm 1, right? The godly man is like the tree planted by the streams of water, but the chaff, not so the wicked, he says, the chaff, the wicked are like chaff, which will burn up in judgment. We don't get one without the other. We don't get the fruitful tree of the gospel bearing fruit in its seasons in Psalm 1 without the chaff. It's always that way. It always has been. And that's why I chose those passages in Revelation. I grew up in a church that had beautiful stained glass windows and in the sanctuary. And one of the stained glass windows in the back was um, donated by one of my, my dad's, uh, the friend and mother of my dad's friend growing up. And uh, it was this beautiful piece where, where Christ is standing with the, uh, the lamb. Now that's a perfectly biblical image, image and I don't want us to, to reject that. It's straight out of um, Old and New Testaments. But isn't it interesting? We love that. We love the picture of Jesus. But I've yet to see a stained glass window showing Christ on his horse with a sword coming out of his mouth. Right? We chuckle about that, right? But why is that? Well, aside from the strange imagery, right? The sword coming out of his mouth. Do you worship a Christ who has a sword? coming out of his mouth. At the end of John chapter three, excuse me, uh, Luke chapter three, where John is speaking, in verse 18, he says, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us that everything that John described, John said in Chapter three is the gospel. It is the gospel. So in the same way, we see John, excuse me, we see Paul and Barnabas confronting. This is what missiologists call a power encounter. It's where they confront the powers of darkness. And Elvis is doing his best to divert the conversation to discredit Barnabas and Paul. And instead, the gospel triumphs. And Sergius Paulus believes. And it is God's mercy that Elvis was only struck blind for a time. 
Is it possible that that was intended to bring him to repentance? We don't know, perhaps. But brothers and sisters, when you and I think about Christ, yes, think of him as the good shepherd. He says he's the good shepherd and the sheep hear his voice. Yes, he is the door to the father. Yes, he is the one who gives us streams of living water as they flow from our innermost being by his spirit. Yes, he is the one who's the bread of life. We're about to be reminded of that this morning. Yes, he is the great teacher. Yes, he is the great prophet. Yes, he is the perfectly benign king, benevolent king. But he is also the one who has the sword coming from his mouth. He's also the one who has not only a reward, but a recompense. He is not only the one who gives us salvation by crushing the serpent's head, but he's also the one who crushes the seed of the serpent. He's not only the one who brings us in to his barn to mix the metaphors John did in Luke 3. We are the wheat, we're the, the wheat that's gathered into the barn. He not only gathers up the wheat in the barn like he gathers the lambs into his arms, but he's also the one who burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And brothers and sisters, if that is not the Christ that we worship, we are not worshiping the Christ of the Bible. You and I have a tremendous privilege, and that is to speak of Christ in a culture that will accept and embrace ideas about Jesus that are true. But we must not forget that at some point in the conversation, at some point in our relationship, at some point in the interaction between the gospel and the culture, there will be places where the culture refuses to hear the gospel. There will be people who oppose Christ. There will be forces that confront the gospel and will not hear it. And we must not grow weary in praying that those forces, by God's grace, not ours, by God's work, not ours, that those forces will either be converted or they'll be taken away. When we come to the Lord's table, we come to a table where Christ endured not only the temptation of the devil, but he overcame the devil. He overcame the effects of the fall. And when we come, we don't simply eat the bread that he provides us. We, in object form, drink his blood that had to be shed for us because we had been on the side of the devil. If it were not for the enmity that God placed between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, we would still be on the side of the serpent. And only Christ's blood could bridge that gap. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, give us grace that we might know you as you are, love you as you are, serve you as you are, that we might become like you in your character, in your holiness, in your love. Amen. I invite you to join me in responding to the word of God by singing together hymn number 318. Now, sadly, uh, uh, unfortunately, there is a typographical error on our screen. So uh, I would ask Isaac, uh, please don't show the words for the hymn uh, for this hymn because there is a there's a bit of typographical error. So I would ask you please just to um, read the text. It's hymn number 318. And because the tune itself is obscure, I've chosen a more familiar tune uh, that matches this, uh, these words. So I invite you to stand with me, please, and turn your hymn most in number 318, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Mm -hmm. 